Hey all, and welcome to the Hellfire Commentaries live stream playthrough of an absolutely beautiful game by the name of Journey. This is a game that I adore quite a lot. It's a very different kind of game to the kind of stuff we've been streaming over the last few days, but hopefully you guys will enjoy it. I have Spa with me. Hey guys, how's it going? And before we get into this proper, I want to show off one particular thing, sort of a change I've made to the way the game's going to run, not really though. This is a pull of a PS3 game that was then ported to PS4 and now it's on PC. The thing that was a little bit divisive with the newer ports is the sand quality on, in the game. It's technically better but it loses a little bit of the charm, the sparkly effect that the PS3 one had. However, going by some advice I've seen in the Steam forums, if you have the standard settings, like the auto detect settings that you would usually have for your PC setup, but set sand in particular to low, it just makes it look a lot more like how it looked on the original PS3 version. But with that housekeeping out of the way, I'm gonna start the game and Spa, what experience or lack thereof do you have with this game, mate? Journey is my favorite band. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> uh, basically nothing. Also, what I said is a lie. Journey is uh, a good band, not one of my absolute favorites, though. Uh, but yeah, no, no experience with this or the other game we'll be playing today. Yeah, so what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be playing through Journey first. And given this is a very short game, after this we're going to be doing a follow-up playthrough of a game called Abzu, which is developed by a different team but has a lot of the same talent involved. So I thought that they'd both be complementary games to one another. I, I, I think my favourite thing so far is the fact that you had to make everything look worse in order to match the PS3, which just sounds hilarious but is also true well it it's just a interesting little change that got made and the thing is like you can see the sparkle effect there that's what sort of got lost in translation but i personally like that it, it's one of those weird little quirks because objectively speaking it's worse you know like what the change there is that the texture is lower quality but, you know, it just adds that little bit more charm to it. I don't know how realistic that is, not that this is going for realism. And I think, I, I guess we saw a little bit of it in the pre-stream part. I don't know uh, what setting you had it on there, but I think it looked different than this. Uh, that was the same, but it's just different camera angles make it look a little bit different. Uh, okay, different different camera angles and a bit of different lighting. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I think the shiny, sparkly effect is pretty good, and uh, I guess that's where we're heading. <laughs> yeah, this is this is like one of the iconic shots that everyone's seen from this game. That is our goal, the mountain. It's sort of got a similar thing going on to what the God of War 2018 game had going, like a similar sort of structure, but obviously the narrative format works completely differently. One of the things that I find incredibly appealing about this game is the fact that there is, to my recollection, not even a single line of dialogue. The entire story is communicated strictly by the visuals and the music. Hmm. Which is a very difficult thing to pull off, but both this game and Abzu, I think, do it absolutely wonderfully. I want to point out that I have the uh, volume setting. We're, we're using Discord screen share for this so I can see it in uh, approximately real time. And I had my volume setting on 69. Nice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, something that people might not know uh, as I'm watching this and seeing some of the patterns and symbols, uh, I'm seeing a lot of symbols that remind me of uh, things I've seen in some Chinese and Japanese mythology. Hmm. Um, the way some of the symbols have blocks in certain shapes, whether they're long ones or short ones. Um, like, things like that. Um, 
Some of those are very reminiscent of... I'm about to reference Naruto, so hold on to your pants. Uh, okay. <laughs> the the eight trigrams technique uh, uses some of those, which of course is rooted in real life mythology as well. But that's where I recognize it from. <laughs> that is absolutely fair. But what A- we've absolutely <laughs> wait till the next game for that one. <laughs> but yes, what I've just picked up there, little bits of cloth that add to the length of the scarf there, and as that gets longer whenever you have a jump section it just increases the jump that little bit more so it's a journey not only in the traditional sense but also in personal growth in a way okay so how much is uh is this game how much does it cost uh or standard pricing i think on pc right now it's about 12 pound so I would imagine probably about fifteen, sixteen dollars, maybe US. Yeah, that that's that's really not bad. That's about how much I would expect, considering it's you know a port of a PS3 game. <laughs> yeah, and it is a very short game too, like I mentioned. So it does have that as well. But you know, it's one of those experience games that you play through and you soak in the mood more than like traditional gameplay. Right. Yeah. And I suppose that moves us into the conversation that was obviously going to come up here. Philosophically talking, what is a game? Because that always gets brought up whenever we have any of these games that are more... I guess the term you'd use is walking simulator, although that does sound a little bit derisive. Because it's interactive, and the interactivity is the selling point. But it does also avoid a lot of the common tropes that would otherwise define a game. Like, say, having a particular challenge to overcome. So it's one of them ones that you could think about that philosophically for hours if you so desired. Well... I, I think it's a similar question to something like if you had a mu- a movie where the screen was blank but you could hear all the dialogue and action still happening and be able to understand the story, would you still call it a movie even if you're not actually seeing anything? And I think yes. Well, see, that one, there is a defined term for that. Like, that's, there are, what you're describing there is basically a radio drama. Yeah, that's true. Whereas this, the there's not really an established name that you could give to this kind of experience. And even when you see games like this and others like it advertised, like when they put a genre, there's all these different kind of not really definitive genre names they'll have. Like some places refer to it as an art game or an experience game, things like that. Interactive narrative. That yeah. That's not a bad one, actually. I, I like that. I I mean, I would count this as a game simply because you are playing it. It is interactive in some form. It doesn't just move on its own. You you're, you can go straight to the destination or you can explore, I assume. Uh, things like music and visuals adapt to what you as the player are doing. So I would count that as the definition of a game. That's fair, yeah. More than anything else. This is what you'd classify Heavy Rain as. I've seen games like that that are more of a drama kind of thing, labelled as interactive dramas, which is kind of different to this in a way, but like, I find it kind of interesting that games of this, like, I guess minimalist gameplay, that's probably another good one that you could roll with, mm-hmm. it's sort of become a little subgenre in its own right. Right, yeah. You have game, games that are very simplistic in their narratives like this, but then you also have the story-based kind of things, like the Quantic Dream games, and, like, you know, Until Dawn, Supermassive games and whatnot. Those are almost, like, the Quantic Dream stuff, I would say, is almost closer to a visual novel, but I don't think you could call this particular game a novel, since there's... There's no text text and no dialogue or anything. Uh, Yeah, the the Quantic Dream ones always felt like sort of an interactive, like a visual novel where you're playing 
like the entire thing rather than you know most visual novels you have like a quick select of where you want to go on a map or something like that also in the, my experience with visual novels quantic dreams have a lot less sex <laughs> well I mean, uh, depending on which one, that could go either way. <laughs> I mean, either way, there's still a lot less of it, but I guess we shouldn't go there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, I think what that white little glow's pointing out, and this is something that is a bit of a unique gimmick with this game, is that there is multiplayer to a degree. The way it works is that if somebody else is online playing the game at the same time you are, there's a chance that they'll get swept into the game with you, and they won't show up by name, at least not until the end of the game, but you will occasionally just see them walking around in the background and doing their thing. Huh, that's kind of really interesting. I think what it's trying to go to, like at least the general idea is if you remember very early on one of the first things we did in the game we saw that mural where there were a lot of characters like our traveler here mm -hmm. and I think it's kind of going with the idea a narrative idea that there's a lot of people who go through their own personal journey and that's just the message that it's kind of communicating yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there's sort of a similar thing that I've seen a lot of MMOs do. Because most MMOs, if they have any kind of story or dialogue, the player's character is meant to be, like, the one. Yeah. You know, the one character that is the most important. Uh, they are the one doing things. They are the one clearing out these enemies. There they and are. there's the other player right there. Yep. Yep. And, and so some MMOs that I've seen uh, set it up that other player characters are similar but like just not quite as powerful kind of thing especially stuff like ff14 or city of heroes i've seen um you know things like that in the story i could get into spoilers for ff14 and in terms of how they handle that but i, I think i'll avoid that considering uh you know <laughs> uh probably people that are interested in those haven't got to that And so now we have a bridge. Yep. This is like the first big open area that we have here, and I have noticed the last few times I've played this game, it's usually been during this section where I first encounter someone. Depending on the playthrough, sometimes the person sticks around, sometimes they take a little bit longer than I do and get left behind. I'm gonna be mostly just going like along to the next area but you know as and when i find the extra mules and stuff if they're nearby i'll go show them off yeah i, I think it's cool to show stuff off but also like we do have another game to play today so <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's these little things here i can't actually remember what these in particular do i think they just give the jump a little bit more of a boost but i may be wrong about that Hey, Deimos. <laughs> I'm not your mother, Deimos. I'm sorry to break it to you. I'm sorry you had to find out like this. <laughs> this definitely seems like a game that you're really meant to go at your own pace, and I like games like that. Uh, again, I've never played anything in this style, but games where you are sort of expected to just explore and do whatever in your own time, like a hat in time or Metroid Prime or whatever, where you have a goal that you're trying to get to, but there's also, you know, the game sort of expects you to go out of your way to find stuff as well. It's that idea of flexibility in the playstyle that, with basically any game I'm a fan of, uh, it's kind of going back to a discussion we had, I think it was on the Spark stream, where we were talking about, like, you know, there's different playstyles that going by different games and that kind of influences whether you're gonna play a certain game to 100% or not. This one I, I feel like with games like this I'm less inclined to because you know it's a journey and you just you, you have a little look around and as until you see fit 
and then you just want to explore the next thing, maybe more so than being a tick in the boxes kind of experience. It, it sort of seems like a game that you would want to play differently every time. Yeah, and that's a similar sort of thing that we'll probably also be seeing with Absu as well when we get to that. Mm -hmm. It's also the kind of game where it doesn't feel obtrusive in any way if you do just sort of lurk around a little bit more. Because there's some games, you know, where you feel like I haven't made any progress in a while. Whereas because the just general presentation, this is so consistently nice, you never sort of feel like I should be moving on, you know? Hmm, yeah. Depending on how you want to play it, of course, every person's going to be a little different in how they perceive certain things. Because I could imagine if I spent, you know, 20 minutes walking around an area, even if I enjoyed it, I could be like, okay, I'm ready to move on now. Yeah. Even if I haven't found anything, it's like, okay... I want a different spot. I want, I want to see uh, some some different locales, even if it all is just kind of sand. Yeah. Well, it, it not to get too far ahead, but there are a lot of surprises visually. So, although you might look at this and think the sand, like the desert's probably going to outstay its welcome, it doesn't. It does do some cool things along the way. All right. Uh, and actually, uh, speaking of Metroid Prime. One of the streams we're going to have later this week is actually I'm going to be playing a randomizer for Metroid Prime 2. Uh, current plan is to have that on Thursday, uh, but we'll see uh, what ends up with that. Uh, Wednesday is actually going to be my 32nd birthday, so I'm going to be taking that day off and just chilling out. <laughs> you don't want me to work you to your bone on the birthday as well? <laughs> <laughs> The original plan was actually that I was going to do a birthday stream uh, of the Prime 2 randomizer with Tom. Uh, unfortunately, since, you know, he hasn't been able to get his PC back, uh, that's obviously not going to be possible. So I decided I would just, you know, do it while we're, um, you know, sort of filling time, I guess, uh, waiting. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he wasn't able to get it fixed the first time due to some kind of shenanigans going on, but uh, you could probably check uh, Tom's Twitter account for info on that. Yeah, it was meant to be picked up again today, but more antics occurred, so it's going to be tomorrow now. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, I have not played the Pathless, but it does look very interesting. I don't know if Tom and Tanner ever got around to doing a quick look of that. There is a quick look on the channel of that. I haven't got around to playing it myself yet. It's a game that I have ready. It's on my list of games to get to. It's just one of those games that, given the kind of games these are, is the one that I'm going to want to be in the kind of position where I can just sit down and soak it in for me first playthrough. Yeah, for sure. So, while I'm juggling like five different editing jobs, probably not the best time for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it could probably be cool for a stream, but again, you wouldn't really be able to, you know, soak it in and, you know, really take everything in and appreciate it. I feel like, from what I saw, the Pathless is a lot more action-oriented than this, and I, I haven't seen Abzu, so I can't comment, but um, it kind of seemed very open in terms of how much was able to explore and like combat and stuff, similar to like Breath of the Wild kind of thing with like some really, really awesome like movement tech that you could do. I'm not too sure about being like Breath of the Wild, but I know it's definitely a much bigger project than what this was and what Absu was. Like the, the, these two games that we're playing, they've both got a runtime of about an hour, an hour and a half, whereas that I've seen from people of been talking about is I think it's more of a four or five hour kind of game. Yeah, all right. It definitely caught my eye. That was one of the things that uh, Tom and I were going to do when I was doing the quick looks, and then it, you know, I, sort of anxiety kept me from being able to work on stuff. So uh, I ended up, you know, basically saying, "Yeah, I'm not really comfortable doing this anymore." Yeah, fair uh, enough. And so he had to bring he had to bring Tanner back in for that. Which, uh, I do apologize, because I sort of end up throwing a lot of the work that I can't do back on Tanner in terms of uh, quick looks and TV comms and stuff, but, you know, I feel like he enjoys that kind of stuff a lot more than I do anyway, 
and so I'd rather have someone who actually enjoys it to be doing it, rather than me, who's having an anxiety attack, you know, thinking about recording an episode of a TV comm, so... Yeah, it's one of them that we just all sort of play to our strengths, really, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned this during the KH1 recording. My strengths definitely lie in streaming. Uh, something, I, and I think we mentioned it during Spark as well. Like, I'm, I'm someone who enjoys streaming more than anything else. I'm very comfortable with it um, in just about every form. Hmm. Um, live recording, like we did with the Xenoblades, I'm usually okay with. Uh, post recording, like we're doing with KH1, is very tough for me. I I get anxious about you know having to fill air and stuff like that. I feel like with the other two kinds, it's a lot easier to react to stuff as it's happening. That's fair. Although I will say you have been very good on the stream over the last few days, and especially with stuff like this, where I just pick out a couple of games you've never seen, and I just say like, "Okay, we're doing these. Hope you're okay with it." <laughs> and you have, been. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like these, these I feel like are they're definitely are artistic enough that I could just kind of appreciate what's going on. Uh, like if you had picked something that I just could not relate with or, you know, appreciate whatsoever, then I think we probably would have had trouble. Like, I don't know, probably uh, God of War 2018. I, I feel like I wouldn't have much to say about that. I feel like I could do okay on a stream, but I feel like, you know, I had to back out of the recording for that one too, because I just don't really have any feelings about the game. Mm, I feel like with that kind of thing, when you pre-recording videos. I always find it works much better if you have played through the game yourself and kind of formed some opinions of it first hand. Whereas like for the stream you do have a little bit more flexibility to jump into stuff blind and you know capture first reactions and whatnot. Yeah, again it's it's able to being able to react to things as they're happening. I think when it's a live recording or a stream of some kind, it's a lot easier for me to react to things happening than it is in a post-recording where I don't know what's coming kind of thing and I have to fill time and I usually end up talking over what's happening uh, because I was trying to say something else. A lot of that's happened in KH1, even if it's a game that I'm, you know, pretty intimately familiar with. I still end up trying to fill time and, you know, end up forgetting something that I was going to say. There was plenty of stuff that I wanted to say, and in fact did say in some, you know, scrapped uh, attempts at recording about, like, Aerith and some of the other characters in Traverse Town that I just didn't get to include in the final recording session. So I'm going to have to bring that up later if I remember it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things like that. Usually what I'll do is I'll make myself a handful of notes of things like at this point I want to talk about this and so like I have a sort of structure but you know sometimes you do maybe miss the opportunity or that's usually where I end up doing stuff in like after the fact and just moving things around. Mm -hmm. Yeah I, I do I do write myself some notes. I'm noticing by the way that whenever you're the one playing the game I end up talking about a lot of uh, background HFC <laughs> meta commentary you know, yeah <laughs> meta commentary kind of stuff so uh, I hope I hope everyone's okay with that but yeah I do I do make myself some notes uh, especially for like for KH1 especially we're talking a lot about the different voice actors that have worked on stuff because I feel like that's a big part of the experience for Kingdom Hearts mm. uh, and so I think it's fine that we're doing a lot of that and so I keep notes for that and you know a couple things that I want to comment on uh, it just so happened that that one part I wasn't able to mention what I wanted to about Aerith in the, you know, final recording that actually got used. Yeah. Like, I've had a few moments like that. I've also had a few moments where I've just said a thing off the cuff and then double-checked it after the fact and had to start nagging Tom for edits, which is always fun. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's been a couple times where I definitely said incorrect things, both in Xenoblade and KH1, and Tom's just like, don't worry about it. Because, I'll, I'll be honest, I suck at pickup lines. 
uh, I do as well, but I also then just spend like an hour and or so just recording the same line until it's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, there was one time uh, in in the old Sunshine playthrough. I'm gonna bring that back again after the stream the other day, where Tom wanted me to do a pickup of some something that I said incorrect or didn't sound right, but he asked me to do it at like nine in the morning. Hmm. And my voice is a weird thing when I first get up about out of bed, where I sound really deep like this, and so it, I, it sounded very strange. And Tom just couldn't get it to work, uh, and so we ended up just kind of going with what the first attempt was. Yeah, I I had a few moments while we're editing the vod for our sunshine run from the other day, fittingly enough, where. I don't know, like, there, there were a couple of lines, that was a very low energy stream, because I think we'd both been kind of having a bad day and we wanted to, <laughs> like, and it was just not quite up to the usual standard, and for my voice in particular, it just sounded off, especially, like, during the first 10 minutes, so there were certain lines that I just had to re-record, but also make it fit, so it's not just like, suddenly I'm energetic, then I'm not, then I am, then I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's a bit strange. Uh, I I was having a pretty good day uh, on on that stream, at least until I got to the pachinko machine level. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like more so me being stressed because of all the PC shenanigans. But yeah, yeah, that that was uh, there were a lot of shenanigans going on with Thomas PC that day. We actually ended up being a little bit late to the stream, um, so I I. You know, if you if you guys had taken like a couple minutes longer, I basically would have just asked you to move it to another day because I figured after all of that, you wouldn't have really been up to it anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, we managed to get it done, and the video is going up tomorrow morning our time, like UK time. But I've got to draw attention back to this. Another one of those moments where the sand looks absolutely beautiful here, thanks to the setting change. Like, look at that there. The the texture itself looks bad, but having the reflection, mm. I think the the shininess is really great. I think having the better texture without that reflection of the sun would be a downgrade in this case. Yeah, I have played through the PS4 version, and it like don't get me wrong, it, it's not a bad port by any means. It's a fantastic way to play the game in its own right. It's just subjectively speaking, I feel like there's just that little bit more charm going on in this, like playing it like this. Uh, yeah, Jeff Keighley's doing his uh, summer of games, game fest, whatever it is he's calling it. Uh, E3, I'm pretty sure, is cancelled, right? Yeah, that's... It's... I think it's cancelled indefinitely now, like, officially. Which, honestly, I'm not that upset about. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Even, like... E3 has gotten to the point, especially with, like, what companies have been doing recently anyway, where they just record a video and show it, rather than having any kind of live presentation. Like, that was happening even before the, you know, lockdown and pandemic and stuff. So, honestly, I'm okay with that. Just have each company, like, put out, you know, a 30-minute video or something like that for their quote-unquote presentation. I don't think we really need E3. It just works so much better because I have found for the last few years there's been E3 in-person presentations. It's always been the most boring shit. Like you'll have a game trailer, then you'll have like five minutes of just people coming on stage and doing their pre-rehearsed bit. That's like so obviously staged and unnatural and basically just jerking each other off for far too long. And it's like, yeah. what's the point? I want to see games, if you don't mind. I, I think some of that stuff has been funny in the past. Like, there's definitely been moments at E3 where they had the skits or whatever that, that I enjoyed, but I think for the most part, for one thing, they can do those in the pre-recorded videos and probably have editing and stuff to make it flow better anyway. Mm. But also, like, yeah, I just kind of want to know about the games. 
You know, if I want to look up funny skits or whatever, I'll look uh, up funny skits. <laughs> okay, let's look at one of the most beautiful things coming up I have ever seen in a video game. Alright, this is, uh... Oh, oh, man. Yes, look at that lighting. Oh. oh, I love it. It's so good. The reflection just makes that so much better. That's the one scene that whenever I think of Journey, it, it's just I see this in my head. Mm hmm Yeah, for sure. This is great. <laughs> just such, like, the color direction, the lighting, just everything about it is, like, just perfect. I envy the people getting to watch this on YouTube because uh, Discord is probably not doing this justice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the fog is, like, just enough to, like, hide a lot of the buildings and stuff, and also make you just stop and go, whoa, like, this is great. <laughs> Now, is this an indie game, or is the company that makes it, like, do they do, like, real stuff? As far as I recall, this was actually published by Sony originally. Okay. I think it was, like, a... Well, yeah, because it didn't come out on PC until quite recently. It was originally a PS3 game. Back when Sony were doing that little push on PS3 for a handful of, like, smaller-scale exclusives... They, I think they, I don't know if they commissioned it or if they just bought publishing rights, but it was Sony exclusive for the longest time. Yeah, I was, I was saying that um, those bits where it cuts to like a white void where our character is seeing another, you know, journeyer, I guess, journeyman, whatever you would say. I think the term's traveler that they use. Traveler, I think, yeah, is, is what I was looking for. That that feels very indie game to me uh having that little interlude every so often uh much like uh spirit fairer we had something like that where the character would like run into the white owl uh, i think it was it's just a a thing i see in a lot of indie games and i guess it's probably in a lot of like triple a games or whatever i think it's just like a way to divide up the narrative without it having to be explicit about it. Mm -hmm. Now, how they managed to get a blue color scheme working in a desert area and have it just fit is beyond me, but look at this. Yeah, it's great, and it's, I feel like you can still tell that it's sand. Mm. Like, it doesn't look like snow, like one would probably expect. Although, I think a little bit having these rocks here kind of does look a bit more like ice, but now that I think about it, but uh, I still think it looks great. I, I sort of see what you mean. I, I think it's just because we've been context clued into the fact that it's still in the desert that it's not jarring. And you got the falling sand there as well, which we had in the other area. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Goldmember is saying in chat that this game is actually on sale on Steam right now for $7. So if that sale is still active when this game goes up on YouTube and anyone watching is interested, feel free to uh, check that out because that is an amazing price for uh, this masterpiece of beauty that we're watching. Absolutely, yeah. Just a shame that sale wasn't going a few days ago when I downloaded this version of it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, apparently the sale is active through the end of May, May 30th. I guess that's not the end of May, because May also has a 31st. Don't listen to me, I'm saying words. <laughs> uh, basically, May 30th is when the sale is set to end, so uh, if this goes up before then, which it should be, uh, feel free to check it out.
we are not sponsored, we're not being paid to tell you this. <laughs> no, we just have incredibly good timing, because at the time we were streaming Spark the other day, there was a sale going on for that game as well, if you remember. <laughs> Well, I mean, I feel like that game is always on sale, just about. <laughs> uh, it's one of them games that if there is any kind of like platformer sale or something like that, you know, it's one of the picks. I think it probably looks obvious what we're going to be doing here. We get to circle around and get more and more of the cloth to lift us higher and higher. Oh, yeah, I see it. This is... um. This is kind of making me think it's underwater now with how you're floating around, which I know is part of the game mechanic, but uh, I think it's also reminding me of an area that's in FF14 uh, that happens to be underwater, uh, and that's why it's making me think of that. Well, I mean, we do have a water-based game coming up after this on the stream, so maybe bear that in mind. Yeah. Go through this way. Is this the kind of thing where you can kind of just take whatever path you want to grab all these things? Within reason, I think, because like you need to get the ones on the ground to be able to get enough of a jump to go up to the higher ones. But other than that, it, I think it is pretty much just do as you wish. Yeah, okay. I don't think you actually need to get all of them, if I recall correctly. I'm mostly just sort of floating around right now because it's pretty. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like if you needed to get all of them, that would be kind of annoying. Because if you happen to miss one of them, and you got to search for it, mm. I feel like that would be uh, really obnoxious. Oh, there we go. I see what you mean. Now we're in this section here, it is a little bit more watery. Just because, like, you can't see the sand. Yeah, the, the rays of light coming in definitely feels like underwater kind of stuff as well. In a way, that might well be symbolic in its own right, in that it's a different form of travel. And, you know, it, given this game's kind of... not explicitly, but it's metaphorical for life in a way. You know, I can kind of see that. Yeah, I could definitely see, like, a lot of stuff is metaphorical in this. Making it look like it's underwater could mean a lot of things, I'm not going to lie. Mm. If if that's something they were going for, uh, there could be a lot of meanings behind that, which uh, I'm probably a little bit too dumb to try to think about. <laughs> well, the beauty of games that have of more of an abstract narrative like this is that it's open to other interpretations. So, you know, like there's not really a wrong meaning to take from it. And I see people in chat are mentioning the game Flower that was also developed by that game company. That game, yeah, we do get a little bit of a jump scare there. All right. The game Flower is a pretty game in its own right. It's one that I chose not to include today because I don't really think it'd lend itself to a stream that well. But it's a beautiful game that if you play it, I would definitely recommend playing on PC for that. Because that was one of those games that was also early PS3, designed to show off the 6-axis motion controls. But the problem is that the 6-axis motion controls are not very good. So if you buy the PC version and play it with an analog stick, despite that going against the original design mythos, it's actually a much more enjoyable experience. Yeah, okay. I mean... Yeah, uh, I, I'm not a fan of the 6-axis, especially in, like, uh, Ratchet & Clank on the PS3. I turn that off as soon as I can. Mm. Having the Guardians, I think they're called, people are saying in the chat, uh, flying around like that, it still almost looks like they're swimming through water. <laughs> we're, we're definitely getting that ethereal underwater vibe still. But I do think it's worth taking note of the fact, oh, we've got a stealth section here, so I should maybe hide around behind here. There's no actual fail state from what I remember, but, you know, there's enough tension there that you don't want it to push you back, like what just happened there, because I weren't paying attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, no, 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 he's getting me, he's getting me. Yeah, just about. No, I didn't make it out of his sight, never mind. <laughs> so, so what happens when you get hit, aside from being knocked away? That's pretty much it. I, like I say, I don't think there's a fail state. Okay. It, it looked like some of your scarf may have been taken away, but I don't know if they would do something like that. It might have been, actually, but this isn't a jumping section, so you can't really tell. I don't know if they would do something like having some of the scarf taken away, because I feel like if you get hit enough and you don't have any left, then you probably couldn't advance onward unless they, you know... Uh, oh, uh, Adri in the chat is saying that you do lose some of the scarf. So I imagine there's got to be a way to manage that later on if you do happen to lose all of it or whatever. Whenever you get to a point where you need the jump, there's always a generous amount of the scarf around. So it's not like you're going to get locked out anywhere. It's more that it just kind of, you know, you, it feels more elegant to have the longer scarf trailing behind you. So that's basically your incentive to try not to get hit, I'd take it. But yeah, even though there is no fail state, it does do a really good job with the tension just because of the how imposing these things here look. Yeah, the sound design and music is really helping as well. And the color. <laughs> yeah, and the bright red as well when they've got their searchlight on you. But I got to safety. <laughs> And yeah, I did also see someone mention Flow a little bit earlier, which is another one of those games that unfortunately didn't get a PC port, at least not yet. So that's one that if you want to play, you've got to just kind of put up with the motion controls. It's one I, I hope gets a PC port later down the line, because although it's much more simplistic than this, and it probably wouldn't have the same appeal to me as this, it's... Just, I really appreciate these guys' work, and I kind of want to experience as much of it as I can. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Yeah, I'm starting to see some of the uh, narrative come through these these little scenes that we're having. It's like, as they show you more and more shots of the other travelers that have gone on the same route, it does give you the vibe that it's like a pilgrimage sort of thing. Especially as like, you know, there's the very distinct final area that we saw right at the start of the mountain. It's like, this is a f very familiar journey. Mm -hmm. One of the top reviews of this game on Steam is just sand. <laughs> <laughs> Steam reviews uh, a wilderness. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, there, there's something special at the best of times. Yeah, we're definitely out of the underwater kind of aesthetic and definitely back to sand now. Go for it, gold member. Go for it. Yeah, seven dollars, like I said, seven dollars for this seems uh pretty amazing. Even if it is just like an hour long game. Cause it definitely feels like something that you can just play over and over. It's uh I just want to relax and soak in like, a nice atmosphere kind of game as well, isn't it? This feels like, I mean, maybe aside from the uh, stealth section, something that's really good to just calm down on a rough day with. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're cutting off the Wii U and 3DS eShop support soon, aren't they? So 
I think I'm going to be saying that he's just topped up his accounts for that in prep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I don't have my 3DS anymore, so I couldn't do anything with that if I wanted to. And uh, uh, I have my Wii U homebrewed, so I don't actually have to worry about the eShop. Nintendo will find you, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe this is the Steam version, Raving Madness. Yeah. But yeah, I have three 3DSs on my desk right next to me, which is absolutely necessary, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least one of them is the uh, capture card for recording. And then you probably have a standard one and a new 3DS, so... No, I have my original one that I was very fortunate that my parents got me back when I passed my exams, and that's why I still hold on to that, even though I don't necessarily need it. It's got a bit of sentimental value because of that. But also, I have a new 3DS XL, which has a capture mod, and I have my backup new 2DS XL, which has a capture mod because you can't get hold of them anymore. So when I saw that the guy had some spare ones in stock, I thought, I probably should get a backup one. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. I kind of wanted to get one, one of those back then, but I was also like, there's not actually a lot of stuff that I want to do on 3DS, and so I just kind of never bothered. Also, you know, the money uh, was also a big thing. <laughs> They are expensive to get hold of, both because, obviously, parts and labour, but also, you know, 3DSs themselves are harder to get hold of in the first place, so, mm -hmm. you know, it just becomes harder and harder to get hold of them over time, sadly. Yeah, there's the platform I was looking for. Ah, nice. Uh, I did actually buy secondhand a DS capture card, uh, which I tried out for a little while, but for that one you have to do the audio in through like uh, the audio jack on your computer, and so everything sounded really fuzzy and it was terrible, and um, the original DS controls like shit, uh, because the D-pad is terrible, so I just kind of uh, sent it back to the guy I bought it from. Fair enough. I think I missed the thing. <laughs> but yeah, like I I technically don't have to use the audio jack, but I do because the USB audio capture is not great. Hmm. So I have that, I run it through a ground loop device just so it doesn't get any static and then capture it through that way. But I think there was a thing here that I'm missing. It might be that up there. But I think I might be a little bit short. And there, there's the guy who's flying around. He's the one I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, that's what I needed. That's why I was getting a little bit lost there. Oh, alright. Nice. Yeah, let's get the next little mural out. I don't know, I think the original DS uh, D-pad is okay. I think the problem that you have with the modern ones is they started making them just that little bit smaller, which I always personally find awkward. Uh, I was trying to record uh, Colors DS on it. And with that, you're like always holding on to the D-pad because you're always moving in some way. Yeah. And it ended up cutting into my fingers, oh. like, after a while on, the, on like, the corners and the edges and stuff, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I much prefer, like, a soft, softer, like, rounded edge or something. That's fair enough. But I will say, like, no matter how awkward the different DS and 3DS models are, at least it's not the bleeding, like, Joy-Con D-pad. That is exact... That is the primary reason why I don't use the switch in handheld mode. Hmm. See, I don't really have a problem with it because they're just like the other buttons. You just kind of got to think about, you know, what they are and not treat it like regular buttons. <laughs> yeah, I, I never got on with that. And I know that there's third party ones you can get, 
but then they don't work without being connected, so you still got to keep the other ones around anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I don't use the Joy-Cons because they're just a little bit too small for my hands. Mm. Uh, so I ended up picking up a Pro Controller pretty quickly, and then of course I ended up with Drift on that one, and so now I have an 8-bit dough, which is uh, doing pretty well for me. Yeah, they. I have one of the Nintendo Pro Controllers. It's it's better than the Joy-Cons, but it's still not great enough. I still find the D-pad not all that responsive. Every now and then it will just pick up like some phantom input. Uh, I've noticed specifically with the official Switch Pro Controller, uh, sometimes it will just not read the input correctly, like you'll be trying to hit right and it reads up. Yeah, every now and then I just get a random up input whenever I'm using the joystick, and why is Nintendo's hardware so bad now? Yeah, I mean... It's a constant trend, it just keeps getting worse. Yeah, ever since the Wii and DS era, it's really been just going downhill pretty bad, which is just really sad to see. That's some nice music. Mm -hmm. The music in this game was composed by Austin Wintory, who has done a handful of these games for that game company and then I think on say Giant Squid, the absolute team. He's also done, I think, a couple of Assassin's Creed games. I'm pretty sure he did Syndicate. And he's one of them guys who you see him popping up in different credits through a handful of different games. It's consistently this sort of really effective emotional music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the kind of music that's really designed to get to you, even if there's not any dialogue to like connect with it. Hey, Mistress of the Stars, thanks for the raid. Oh, nice one. Welcome to anyone who's just joining us. We're playing through this absolutely gorgeous game, Journey. And after this, we'll be playing through another absolutely gorgeous game called Absu. So I hope you enjoy what you see. Yep, and uh, also you could stick around. I believe uh, Snake and company will be doing Fantasy Star Online 2 for Multiplayer Mondays this evening. And we've got some other streams uh, going on later this week. So uh, if anyone is interested in uh, what we have planned, uh, feel free to leave us a follow and stick around. Okay, so now, as you can tell, we're getting closer to the mountain and the sand has become snow. Yeah, it is actually snow now, yep. And it's like, when this hits in, you know, you start realizing that, you know, we thought it was a little bit snowy beforehand, but this is when it's like actual genuine cold, you know. Right, yeah. It's a colour theory thing that, again, I've already gushed about, but this game does incredibly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm being cold, so I'll be back in a minute. That's fine, mate. I'm gonna maybe take a bit of a gentle trek up the mountain here, because this is one of those moments that you just sort of want to soak in. Are we gonna build a snowman? I don't think so, sorry. I'm not sure if this is the same person we had in the desert area earlier or not, but I, I don't know, it's, I don't usually have someone around me when I get to this point in the game. And judging by the length of their scarf, I would imagine they're on a second run. I think you can do that. I think there's like a new game plus kind of thing. <laughs> oh hey Tanner, this looks like t-shirt weather for you. It probably does. <laughs> Is he just flexing the fact that he's got a longer scarf there? Now you get some windy sections and that's what them little pillars are trying to cue you off for. Because you are really intended to stand behind them so you don't get blown back. But also, if you try walking anyway, you get to see the scarf blowing around elegantly. and. 
I'm going to be honest, I'm feeling a little bit insecure here. <laughs> I don't know if there's a cap on how many times you can New Game Plus it. Caps at four times, that makes sense. So I feel like by that point you're at a jump level where you could probably just jump over everything. The thing that sadly doesn't translate to the stream that well, that I think is also very well done about this segment, is that up until this point in the game, it hasn't really done all that much with controller vibration. But then you get to this point and you can feel the wind there. Maybe I'm pushing me luck with some of these sections here, but he seems to be timing himself much better than I am. Let's try and just catch up to that one. I think he's trying to help me. Let's let it blow and then I'll take me chance. Yeah, it's like we're huddling for warmth here. That's actually really effective. I like this a little bit melodic when we push the echo button. Come on, buddy. Now, I think there's another jump section coming up soon, but I can't remember whether it's here or the next part. Let's just tuck myself in. The controller is just very subtly vibrating still, which makes me think there's something coming. I think it might be over here, it might be somewhere else, but I think somewhere around here there's a hidden mural. Don't think it's here though. It might be... it's in one of the little crevices somewhere, but you know, we might find it, we might not. Is that it over there? I don't think so, no. Look at that full moon. Got a bit of a chorus going when we're both doing that. I know you have a bigger jump than me, but you don't have to jump up the stairs to flex. Alright, oh, I think that might be the part. I don't know if there's enough of the cloth to be able to get up, but I think it's up from here. Oh, there we go. That's what I needed. Can I get up? Yes, I can. That's the one I was thinking of. Let's cross the bridge. The bridge here 
is one of the things that was prophesized on the mural earlier on. So that's like one of the first proper indicators that we're getting close. Don't think, no, there's nothing around there. Alright, let's see, can we make this ourselves? It's a little bit nervous there because it looked like I weren't going to land on the ribbon properly. Let's see if he'll stay with us for the rest of the game. Get a side on angle, like look at that. And there's the guy coming. I'm gonna kind of keep an eye on where he is more than anything else. But I do still need to be careful about the wind. Oh god, I want to get in there. Boo. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, I'm not I'm not at risk immediately, so it won't gonna get me. I see we have another self section and another character, another player here with us who has a very, very long scarf. Yeah, we were just talking about that with the chat that it looks like he's on maybe a third or fourth round because this game has a kind of new game plus thing where you can carry over your scarf hmm okay it's getting windy again should probably try and pick up more of these as I go along probably best that you get whatever you can hmm I don't think there's that much more in terms of flying sections, but you know, you, you, it never hurts to be prepared. So, have you done uh, New Game Plus for for any of these yet so on uh, PS4 or whatever? I haven't as of yet. No, I've like the times I played this, I played it originally on the PS4. That's the first version I got hold of, and then I did that again for when I did the Flames World Let's Play. So I wanted a fresh run from that. So I haven't had a, t a chance to play it through New Game Plus properly just yet, but it's probably something that I'm gonna have a play with at some point. Because you know, yeah, I'm, okay. I've seen, I've lost. Oh, there he is. Like, I, I see the length of his scarf there, and I, it, I just feel a little bit insecure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if that if that's carrying over from like multiple playthroughs, does that look, like affect how high you can jump in the early levels? It seemed like he was doing some neat little jumps up the stairs and whatnot, showing off a little bit, so I would assume so. Oh, okay. Alright. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool that they uh, let you come back with, like, super jumpy powers like that. I think I might be going the wrong way, unless he's just following somewhere else. Well, this seems like the highest point in this, like, little area. But uh, like, there's. It also looked like there was stuff over to the right of where I am now. So maybe if I go up there and have a little look. I think he's just trying to communicate something, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. See, there's more like stuff built up this way as well. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't hurt to like. Go around and uh, you know find some more stuff just just because really. Mm. Oh, I can feel the wind picking up, so it's probably this way. This feels like the kind of game where the world feels like it just could expand forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, like the uh, the part that you need to go to is obviously like a very set location, but it could just keep going on forever. Is kind of what it feels like. Okay, here's another stealthy bit. So let's try and hide and make your scarf is giving us away. Can you like tuck that in a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I swear, if you get us caught... <laughs> <laughs> now, is this a thing where you can do, like, a dedicated co-op? Or is it, like you said, where you just kind of can pick someone randomly? It's just a random thing, which I think is fitting, honestly, given the kind of thing they're going for. It's, yeah. like... The fact that you have very limited communication with the other guy, I feel like that adds to the experience. Yeah. Because you can do your little echo there and, like, whether he interprets what you're putting down is up to chance, but, you know. Yeah, you could do a, a proper co-op if you're the only two people playing on whatever server. <laughs> hey, I'm pushing me luck a little bit here. I can feel it. I'm I'm sure there is a mod that could like guarantee that two people like get together in the same game or something. I feel like that's something someone would set up. Maybe I don't know if there is yet because the PC pool. I don't think it's been out that long. At least from what I remember. You you just made it into the hiding yeah. spot. <laughs> now that's the obvious way to go, but this looks tempting. Okay, no, there isn't anything there, that's fine. Because there was, on the way up uh, to this part in the snow area, there was one little bit off to the side that had a hidden mural. So I'm trying to keep my eyes open for anything I might have missed last time I played it. Ah, okay. And uh, your little buddy waited for you. Ah, oh, nice, yeah. But yeah, I know we are getting into endgame here, and that's why the tension is definitely picking up. Mm hmm Yeah, I'm loving this, uh, this shot where the camera's pulling back like this. It's especially effective because it hasn't really done that since the start of the game. Mm hmm So it's like, now it's telling you that it's obviously pulling back for a reason. There's obviously something that you need to be prepared for. We have got all of those graves there, which kind of implies that maybe the journey hasn't gone as smoothly for some of the other travellers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need to build up my scarf a little bit now. It must be giving me all these for a reason. Yeah. With uh, you and the other guy constantly pulsing like that, it's uh, kind of making like a tune or something. Mm, yeah, I don't know if it's intentional, but that's happened a few times as we've both been doing that, and it's it feels like it could have been intentional, the fact that we're sort of playing off each other like that. Feels like the pulse is a lot bigger than it was at the beginning of the game, too. I think that adjusts with the scarf size as well. And also, you can hold it and charge it up, so there's that effect in it as well. Because I can uh, still do little okay. pulses like that. Yeah. There's no UI, so I can't really tell much of like what's going on with inputs or anything. <laughs> yeah. Let him catch up a bit. There we go. I think it would be really fascinating if this random person that got with us was someone that was on the stream watching. Mm. <laughs> I think that would be really cool, but I feel like the chances of that are pretty slim. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the wind's picking up even more. No, there's nothing that way, so we've got to go straight into the wind. Yeah, I'm sure if a uh, a bigger streamer played something like this and a bunch of people tried to like get in on their game, then someone would be pretty likely to end up doing it. But uh, we're we're not a big streamer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, I think I'll get away with this here. 
if I stand here. Um, maybe not. <laughs> no, nope. all right. Because the way the wind's coming through there is coming from both directions that so it's blowing against me, so I've kind of got to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. It felt. I think the other guy was able to stand behind that rock. Mm, yeah, he was. Yeah, they were just a little bit further behind it. I'm catching up. He probably wants what I'm doing. I can feel the vibration from the controller that tips you off when the wind's about to come, which I think is nice. Ah, okay, yeah. I keep losing track of which one's me. <laughs> yeah, especially like zooming out like this, and uh, especially on the, the screen share for me, it's very hard to pick out anything that's happening because uh, Discord doesn't like my internet any more than anything else does, so it honestly looks kind of bad. <laughs> I'm the one at the front right now. That's cool. Mm hmm. Okay. I feel like you can't have too much left. Yep, there's the, uh, mm. the goal up there. Yeah. Some ominous lightning accompanying it, I think. And that settings change that I did is absolutely helping the snow texture there as well. It's giving it a similar sort of sparkle that the sand has. Yeah. Which which I think makes a lot a lot of sense for snow as well. It should have some kind of, you know, reflective property. Mm. But you can see that this has eaten up both of our scarves now just because the wind's getting so intense. Mm hmm That he's getting thrown around all over the place as well. I've got basically no echo left. Now, is this, this the kind of thing that you can fail, or do you just kind of have to keep pressing on until you get to the end? You press on until you can't press on anymore. Okay. Uh, you can see, compared to that last scarf that he had, to no scarf left now. Like, you can't. Neither of us can jump or barely do an echo or anything. Mm hmm. Yeah, I see that. And it's very telling what's going on when you look how many little graves that we've just walked past. Mm-hmm, yeah. I kind of want to keep him with me. Yeah, someone said in the chat that if you guys are near each other, you're, like, sharing energy. Mm. I don't know, like, how accurate that is, but it's definitely a really cool thing if that is the case. He's struggling. So close. Hmm. Come on, just a little bit more. vision starting to go and everything. Yep.
think we might be getting a second chance. Hmm. Is this when Live and Learn starts playing? <laughs> I was just thinking it's a supersonic <laughs> mode. <laughs> uh. I think what they're going for here, at least my reading of this, is the idea of perseverance being rewarded and I really like that as a way to kind of cap off the game mm -hmm. Cause like again that is just my reading of it and you know that's the beauty like I said you know you can read this however you want and I think that was our guy there yep there he is he's still with us nice that's pretty cool um I, I like that reading especially um I feel like this is a game that Anyone can play it, just because of how simple it is in premise and control, it seems like. Mm. Uh, with, like, with enough time, I think pretty much anyone that can play video games could play this. And so I feel like this is something that... Uh, to touch on this a little bit, so obviously I don't want to go too deep into it, but I feel like... Um, religions could definitely take like this game and share it with you know the congregation or whatever because that perseverance and you know there's a lot of uh stuff that could be seen as such i feel that because the narrative is as open to interpretation as it is like no matter what your faith or your spirituality may be you're going to find some relatable idea here yeah and that, I know, like, there's always a lot of discussion about, like, video game narratives, whether they're relatable to more people or less people and all that. I think that's a very hard thing to nail down, and it's the sort of thing that is a strength of a game that tells its story without any dialogue, without, like, any kind of detailed characters. And, like, not every game can do that, but they've taken advantage of the fact that their game can. Yeah, this, this again, it's something that anyone could play because of the open-endedness and sort of simplicity of its design mm. and, uh, you know, implementation. So, uh, I, I think this is a game that I won't say anyone, like, everyone should play it, but I feel like it's something that anyone can play. Is, is definitely how I feel about it. It's accessible to anyone who takes an interest, yeah. Ooh, that music. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's a general trope in basically any form of media that I absolutely adore, and that's when the ending is a display of catharsis, and that's exactly what's going on here. We had the struggle, and then as soon as that struggle's over, we get, like, we can just fly through this without any inhibitions whatsoever. And it's wonderful. You know, like, I've been gushing over this game the whole time, but it's for a reason. Yeah. I mean, that's that's why you showed off, like, Spark 2 and the ending that that had. Mm. Uh, very cathartic with that final boss, or like a supersonic section or something like that. That kind of ending where you the character and therefore the player gets to go all out mm. it's like we've we've had the struggle we're powerful now let's take it apparently uh, according to audrey or adri in the chat uh, the developers struggled with getting this ending right even to the point that they scrapped the whole thing and redid it possibly multiple times so I mean, it definitely looks like they nailed it to me, because this is exactly what I would expect uh, from something like this. And at the same time, I think it fulfills that expectation. I think being able to expect something like this doesn't detract from it. And I'm not sure how this looked on the PS3 version, but... I absolutely adore particle effects like this. When they're done well and they don't impact the performance, like that's absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how we sort of had that clear vision 
in in the previous area and now it's gone back to being foggy because we are basically reaching the destination mm. we're sort of being reminded of the journey to get here yeah and the fact that our guy is doing figure eights in the snow <laughs> maybe <laughs> taking away from it a little bit but yeah maybe, maybe a little bit it seems like uh, you've both lost the scarves again though i think what he's kind of implying is that we have achieved the goal now because we're at the top yeah you don't need them anymore Because right through that split there, that's where we want to be. Yeah, I I certainly have to agree with the um, the texture on the sand slash snow. Uh, having that shininess or that reflective quality really adds a lot to it. It really does. I know we've said that a lot, but man, I I, I couldn't imagine this without that. Back to the blue. You've seen people draw hearts in the snow, that's also fitting. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I need to spell out what walking into the light symbolizes, but just as the cap on this story, you know, this is what I wanted. Yeah, this is the end of the journey. I like that the, the camera as the player stops, but the character keeps moving forward. Yeah, and I also like that all we see now is the silhouette. Because it's fading away. There we go.
Uh, I think the last thing in the credits. Here we go. Companions met along the way. Lab Mem 196 and Essence. So it was somebody else who joined us later on. Oh, and Unicorn. We met more people along the way than I thought. Jesus. Hey, hey, Raving Madness, one of the guys in the chat here. Oh, there you were. Oh, I didn't realize that you were playing along with us. Thank you for coming along, though. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. See, it ended up happening, the thing that I said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a very short break. Then we will be back for another game that follows in a similar vein to this, but with its own flavour to it. And that will be Abzu. So if you're on the stream, we'll see you shortly, probably in about two or three minutes. If you're on YouTube, eh, I don't know, I haven't scheduled this yet, but we'll see you shortly. Alright, thanks everyone.